developing right now on Morning News Now, a massive manhunt for a mass shooter in Maine. This morning, tens of thousands of people ordered to shelter in place until the suspect, considered armed and dangerous, is found. He knows warfare. He understands it. He may not have ever been deployed, but he's smart. He knows what to do. This as we learn more about some of the victims, at least 18 now dead. We have team coverage. Also this morning, Israel set for a ground invasion in Gaza with more overnight raids as calls grow for a ceasefire to let aid in and civilians out. Plus, the U.S. striking Syria in a series of attacks. Officials call self-defense will bring you the latest. Also today, the man once known as the Crypto King, now a key witness in his own fraud trial. More on Sam Bankman Fried's testimony in front of a judge as he prepares to face a jury. And we're flipping the script with a look at a new project opening doors for comedians of color. Joe sat down with the founders of the American Black Film Festival about why they're venturing into the world of comedy. Excited to bring you that conversation coming up a little bit later this hour. Good to have you with us on this Friday morning after a busy news mm -hmm. week. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to begin with that multi-state manhunt underway for the shooter that killed at least 18 people, hurt 13 more in Lewiston, Maine. This morning, tens of thousands remain under shelter-in-place orders. Overnight law enforcement surrounded the last known address of the suspect, Robert Card, but there was no sign of him. That scene, just one area of intense focus. A relative of the 40-year-old suspect, tells NBC News that Card has struggled recently with acute mental health issues. Card is a longtime Army reservist who officials say threatened a military base and was sent by his own commanders to a mental health facility in July. Now, as the community reels from the worst mass murder in Maine's history, grief-stricken families are struggling with so much loss. It's, it's awful. That moment when I got the call and said, Yo, he's dead. It, it just, it brought me back. It brought me right back to my knees. The world lost a great girl, and I lost a precious daughter. For the very latest, we are joined now by NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton in Lewiston. So, Antonia, first of all, what is the latest on the manhunt for the suspect? Good morning, guys. Well, law enforcement has fanned out across New England, and we're talking about an investigation that is not only med led by the Maine State Police, but is involving federal partners, FBI, ATF, as well as other local law enforcement agencies, and with assistance from states like Massachusetts and New Hampshire here. And that is, of course, because he is on the run, and there is concern that he may not even be in this county, or perhaps even in Maine at this point. So authorities have a kind of wide lens here. We don't know the exact perimeter. Um, and while, you know, you just talked about the uh, search warrants executed last night, we know that authorities are considering the possibility, you know, he owned uh, jet ski uh, boats. Um, you know, there are multiple ways in which he could have moved. And as many people have discussed here, we know more about both his mental state and uh, his, his training, his past. He was an army reservist. Uh, he was incredibly uh, proficient in the use of firearms, had been an instructor in some capacity and so you know we're you, we're not just talking about anyone on the run here. We're talking about somebody who would very much perhaps have survival skills, have knowledge of the wooded areas throughout Maine. And that is why we are still under a shelter in place order here. Businesses are closed. School is out another day, second day in a row. Uh, three people are still in critical condition behind me here. Three of the victims passed away in the medical facility here. And so we're in this really heartbreaking and excruciating place, guys, where, you know, the community is starting to grieve still waiting for the confirmation of the names of some of the victims, but also unable to gather. They can't have vigils. People can't, you know, meet up in public and, uh, you know, process all of this together because we are still in an active threat. Absolutely. Such a good point. Antonia, tell us also in the aftermath, I know we're learning about the victims. Tell us about them. Well, NBC News has independently, independently verified 14 of the 18 people who uh, were killed that night. 
But as I mentioned, you know, three other people are still in critical condition and we're learning from some of the residents who we've had conversations with. I spoke to one woman, uh, a woman who's lived here her entire life named Cynthia, Cynthia Hunter, who was here at the ER as people were brought in minutes after 7 p.m. as the shootings transpired. And she describes seeing people of all ages brought in in critical condition here. We know from the 14 that we have identified that they're of mixed uh, genders, ages here. Um, and then we also were learning a bit more about what was happening that night at the bowling alley. It was youth night. And at uh, the bar and restaurant uh, where the other half of the shooting took place, we know that there was a gathering of deaf cornhole players. And so this has sent shockwaves through the entire community, but it has had an outsized impact on the deaf community here in this part of Maine. And so there's immense grief there um, and an effort to reach out to, to families and friends of those who were involved in those tournaments and youth nights to see what kinds of supports they need now. And what we're seeing is people are calling their local radio stations. They're reaching out to each other in groups on Facebook right now because they can't get together in person. And so mm. they're kind of finding ways to communally grieve and talk about their losses or, you know, really just connect notes about what happened that night uh, in the best ways that they can, guys. So, Antonia, the shelter in place order, which impacts towns and schools up to 50 miles away. Any idea how long that's going to stay in place? Will it be until card is caught? That's what it's looking like right now, although, you know, there are some hopes from the community that perhaps they'll get some information uh, that will allow them to bring at least school back. Uh, you know, it's been devastating for kids who have been uh, stuck at home, living in fear, um, you know, waiting to hear when they might be able to leave their homes. We've heard from people who say that they've been turning their lights out when the sun goes down at night to make sure that, you know, if Robert Card is out there, he doesn't see their home as a target, doesn't choose to come visit them. They've been locking their barns, locking up their cars. And so, you know, the, the urgency here is to try to get a little bit of life back to normal, a little bit of community uh, presence here on the ground. But what we've heard from authorities is that so long as there is still this concern of an active threat that they want people to shelter in place that's the best information the best advice they can give people right now i, I don't think you can see it behind me here uh, but all day yesterday there were officers here who had long guns and they told us that they were going to have that kind of presence in front of the hospital so long as that active threat was in place and they felt that they needed the shelter in place order here guys Antonio, we can, though, see, and as you just referenced, that you are in front of that hospital. Do we have any more information on those who were injured in this? Well, we know that three people are in critical condition and still receiving care here, although doctors and authorities have declined to comment on the exact profile on whether uh, any of those people are minors. Uh, you know, the community, though, of course, at this point, if you are, of course, a friend or a, a mom or dad and you haven't seen your loved one, you're starting to get a sense that you may be about to receive some of some of the worst news, you know, a family could possibly receive. And so the community has been trying to compare their own notes. But we know that three people died here that night, that three people are still receiving treatment um, and that others were sent to other medical facilities around the state. And we expect to receive updates on them soon. All right. Antonia Hilton in Maine. Antonia, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, as the manhunt continues this morning, we're learning more about the suspect's background. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock is in Bowdoin, Maine with the details. In Robert Card's hometown of Bowdoin, Maine, area-wide shock. It's mind-blowing. Everything about it is it's unbelievable. I mean, why this is going on and why this happened. Even as the suspect's own family reveals chilling details about the decades-long Army reservist. His sister-in-law telling NBC News they alerted police and military officials that Card was experiencing an acute mental health episode in the months before Wednesday's massacre, saying he'd been fitted for high-powered hearing aids a couple of months ago and was picking up voices that he had never heard. His mind was twisting them around. The family concerned about the mental state of someone who performs gun training. It was what we did, meeting him and the way that he showed us how to use a weapon. And then smart. He's really smart. And he's tactical. Former Army Reservist Phil Gregory says he learned how to use an M16 rifle from CARD. They weren't in the same unit, but the 40-year-old left an impression on Gregory. He knows warfare. He understands it. He may not have ever been deployed, but he's smart. He knows what to do. I think they need the soldiers, to be honest with you, to be here. I really do. The assault rifle, believed to be the one used to massacre and maim at least 30 people, was purchased legally in 2023, according to two senior law enforcement officials briefed on the matter. 
And officials tell NBC News Cart threatened a military base and was sent by his own commanders to a mental health care facility for two weeks of psychiatric treatment in July. How could someone that fits that profile still be in possession of semi-automatic weapons? Well, I do think that the statutes around firearms and the possession of those are pretty complex. I know that we'll, we will be reviewing that information as we move forward. Back in Bowdoin, where Cart's family has owned land for generations, childhood neighbor Richard Goddard is blindsided. No one would have seen this coming. Never. Never expected anything like this to happen here. There are quite a few new developments seemingly coming in by the hour, including law enforcement saying that a gun was found in that white Subaru. They're checking now to see if it's the same weapon that was used in the mass shootings. At the same time, we're learning that the Card family owns hundreds of acres here as police are scouring the area with the Card saying that they warned authorities that this is someone who needed help. All right, Sam Brock, thank you very much. Well, new satellite images of the Gaza Strip show the damage left behind by three weeks of airstrikes being carried out by Israeli forces. Here they are on your screen. According to the UN, 42% of homes in Gaza are now uninhabitable. Thousands more have sustained moderate to severe damage. The death toll in Gaza is also rising. The Hamas-run health ministry says more than 7,000 people in Gaza have been killed. The group also released the names of those victims after President Biden expressed doubt about the validity of those numbers. NBC News correspondent Jay Gray joins us now from Tel Aviv with the latest. Hey Jay, so in the last few days also let's talk about what we've seen militarily, these targeted ground raids of Gaza and the Israel Defense Forces say that they will continue those as they prepare the anticipated larger ground invasion because this is just these sort of small teams going in. Tell us about what we've seen and I understand last night there were more of these raids. How do they compare to what we've seen previously in terms of airstrikes? Yeah, and Savannah, we've seen the strikes from the air, and they do continue, but these are different, like you talk about. They're bringing tanks and other equipment inside Gaza, crossing the border with Gaza and moving in for what they call targeted raids uh, at specific uh, sites inside Gaza. We know that they've taken out operational structures and some of the anti-tank areas there, and, and it's clear, and last night seemed to be uh, even larger than the night before as far as the amount of equipment and number of troops that have moved inside, but it's clear uh, that they are clearing the way for, as they say, the next phase of this war, which it appears will be on the ground. So, Jay, the United Nations set to hold another vote today, this time on a resolution from Jordan. It calls for immediate yeah. ceasefire of bombings in Gaza, comes after almost all Arab countries condemn the attacks on Palestinians. So what did we see in yesterday's session, and, and do we expect Israel to stop the bombing if the resolution does pass? Yeah, and look, what the resolution today is is going to say is that they want a cessation of all hostilities. They they want this thing to end for now. They're going to call uh, for, at the very least, some pauses, humanitarian pauses to allow uh, more aid into the area. And that, you assume, would include fuel, which isn't going to happen. And, and you ask if Israel is going to stop. What they have said repeatedly is that they're not going to stop until they rid the world of Hamas. That is what they're saying. And they're saying that any uh, attempt to stop them would be tying their hands. That's quoting uh, the Israeli leaders, uh, tying their hands at protecting the people of Israel. And Jay, here in the States, family members of the hostages taken by Hamas met on Capitol Hill Thursday afternoon to plead yeah. for their release. I want to play a little bit of that first. We demand not only the U.S., but all of the international community put at its highest agenda, number one agenda, bringing the hostages back home now. The United States is the only one who can lead this international effort to make our loved ones come back safely. So, Jay, that also comes amid news that Russian officials say a delegation from Hamas traveled to Moscow to discuss the release of the hostages. What do we know first, of course, about the status of those being held in Gaza, just the latest on hostages, but then also what kind of role Russia could play here, why that meeting would have happened? 
Yeah, and look, uh, what we know is that there are two, 224 hostages now. That's the latest number uh, from the IDF. We've heard from the hostages saying they're, they've been treated well while in captivity. Uh, you know, Russia has ties to key players here in the Mideast, so they could help facilitate some of this if that's their goal. From the start of all of this, they have blamed uh, a failure of U.S. diplomacy as the reason for the entire crisis. Jay Gray, thank you very much for your reporting. The Syrian crisis in Gaza is getting worse as food and water is dwindling and trucks with relief supplies are only slowly making their way across the border. Journalist Akram El Sadri is in Gaza with the latest details. Khamiuni city has been witnessing a very long and painful night where the bombardment was continuous and even intensified in the different directions in Khamiuni city, in the east, in the south, in the north, in, in, and also in the west. People were falling dead and injured, and the heavier bombardment has been taking down whole, block, whole blocks in Khan Yunus. In Khan Yunus refugee camp, last night, 25 people were killed under the rubble of their houses when an aerial attack reduced the whole block into rubble. Khan Yunus refugee camp is a very dense area where many, where all the Palestinian refugees in Khan Yunus are living there. Some of them are outside of, the, of uh, Khan Yunus refugee camp, but most of them are living in that refugee camp, and it was targeted three times yesterday taking the life of around 40, hand palace, 40, uh, 40 Palestinian refugees and also leaving 100 others injured. Uh, Nasser Hospital, the one hospital that I'm standing in now, has been receiving the influx of the people who are injured. Hundreds of people literally were coming to Nasser Hospital from all different areas of Khan Yunus city. When I was on my way to Nasser Hospital, I saw with my own eyes two aerial attacks that were so massive and I think they were targeting some houses in the uh, Khan Yunus uh, uh, north area. So the bombardment is heavier, the, bombard the bombardment is continuous, and the number of people who are injured and killed is increasing. According to the Palestinian Ministry of Health, the number of people killed so far is more than 7,000 people, and they have made a special list of the names of the people, their ID numbers, for the sake of just providing a documentation and a proof for the number of people who have been killed so far. Nasser Hospital has been struggling. They have a problem, they have a severe problem with the uh, uh, shortage of the uh, medical consumables and supplies. They have been making appeals and have been making calls for action for the international community and for, local, for the local community as well. They have been calling upon the international community to allow the expeditious entry of fuel supplies to keep operating the hospitals and keep saving the lives, according to the spokesperson of the Minister of Health. And they have also been making similar calls of actions for the local citizens in Gaza and in Khan Yunus. They have been calling upon those people who might have some limited quantities of fuel to bring that fuel to the hospital so that it would help them continue and resume their activities and continue saving their lives. When it comes to the supplies that were entering Gaza from the Egyptian side, around 72 truckloads were allowed into Gaza throughout the six past days which was also uh, something that is below than the, the needed and it was, that was also voiced by different UN, uh, different UN officials and local officials, Minister of Health officials. They are saying that the, whatever is allowed in Gaza is below the minimum and is insufficient as not going to, to change a fraction or of the suffering that is happening to the people and that there is a need also to look into the nature of the things that are allowed into Gaza, including fuel supplies that are now to, uh, coming to a full stoppage and also they are depleted quickly in the Gaza Strip. So the situation keeps intensifying. The bombardment keeps targeting areas, different areas in Khan Yunus and throughout the Gaza Strip, Gaza South and Gaza North. And there seems to be much more suffering coming for the Palestinians in the coming days if those food supplies were not allowed and if the number of truckloads entering Gaza has not been increased. All right, Akram al Sadri, thank you so much for that report. Now, as the situation in the Middle East continues, the effects of the war are being felt here in the U.S. A troubling new report from the Anti-Defamation League found there has been a dramatic increase in anti-Semitic incidents since Hamas's October 7th attack. According to the report, incidents of harassment, vandalism, and assault increased by 388% over the same period from last year. Let's bring in Oren Siegel for more on this. He is the vice president of the Center on Extremism at the Anti-Defamation League. Thank you for joining us, Oren. So according to this report, there were 312 anti-Semitic incidents between October 7th and 23rd. 190 of those were said to be directly linked to the war in Israel and Gaza. So 
Why is the war having such a huge impact right now? And why are we seeing this just dramatic rise in hate in just the last three weeks? Sure. It's not uncommon for conflict in the Middle East to result in spikes in anti-Semitic activity in this country and, and other types of hate, in part because of the way that the public discussion, the discussion online is, uh, you know, animating some of these activities. These are assaults. This is harassment. This is vandalism. And at a time where some of the broader discussion around the massacre on October 7th includes people who are glorifying, celebrating, and justifying it, that's why the Jewish community feels vulnerable. Um, and in part, I think that's why we're seeing the spike in incidents here in the U.S. and globally. We also, Oren, I mean, what's happening on social media is is really just startling. The report found that there's been a nearly 1,000 percent increase in the daily average of violent messages that mention Jews and Israel in these extremist channels online. What role do these online channels play, these platforms, social media, in all of this and in the spread of hate? Well, we have to understand people's worldviews are often created um, in these online spaces. So the, the data that you shared about the threats, those, those are in some of the darker spaces that the ADL tracks, where we know uh, the types of language and campaigns that are organized there animate real world activity. But frankly, you look at some of the more sort of broader uh, established social media, and so much of what we're seeing there is, is designed to confuse people or to create anxiety. I mean, it's very hard to get actual information about what's happening uh, during this conflict. And so what social media companies need to do is not allow themselves to be exploited by either extremists who want to incite violence or by those who just want to confuse uh, and disorient the public at a time where they need information that is accurate more than ever. Mm. So we know there are no easy answers or sadly quick solutions, but what are some of the actions you would like to see taken to try and slow the hate, the spread of anti-Semitism? I think our, our public discussion, again, whether it's social media or even in our broadcast news, is one about sort of black and white, left and right, um, Palestinians versus Israelis. And we have to understand that when the conflict occurs um, and tempers flare, uh, we see hate targeting all communities. And so we actually need to understand that there's sort of a shared mission here uh, in order to push back against the hatred. And you do that by speaking out and not justifying violence being an ally for others in the community who may be targeted. And, you know, trying to get some cool heads to prevail during a very difficult time. All right. Orrin Siegel, thank you so much for joining us this yes. morning. We do appreciate it. Important information. Overnight, the Pentagon said U.S. fighter jets hit Iran-backed targets in Syria. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said the strikes were, quote, self-defense and that they were in response to a series of recent drone attacks against U.S. personnel in Iraq and Syria. NBC's global security reporter Dan DeLuce and our White House correspondent Ali Rafa join us now to talk about this. Good morning to both of you. Ali, let's start with you. Walk us through what the Pentagon and Austin are saying about these strikes. What are the details we have right now? Yeah, guys. Well, this was a dramatic retaliation, but also not too surprising, considering that since Israel's war with Hamas began on October 7th, we have repeatedly seen White House and Pentagon officials warn any actor, but specifically uh, Iran and its proxy groups, H uh, Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, from trying to broaden out this war, from trying to potentially provoke the United States from getting involved and uh, broadening this war out. Defense Department officials saying they won't hesitate to take additional action to protect U.S. forces in this area, saying retaliation would be at the time and place of the U.S.'s choosing. And we saw that retaliation uh, last night in a statement, uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin says U.S. military forces conducted self-defense strikes on two facilities in eastern Syria used by Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and affiliated groups, a response to a series of ongoing and mostly unsuccessful attacks against U.S. personnel in Iraq and Syria by Iranian-backed militia groups that began on October 17th. Austin saying Iran wants to deny its role in these attacks against our forces is, he says, we will not let them. So we understand that two F-16 fighter jets specifically targeted weapons and ammunition storage areas in this base in Syria. A defense official saying that those were the types of weapons used on U.S. forces in those attacks. Uh, 
the uh, officials say that uh, only Iranian-backed militia, no civilians were on the base at the time, but they don't have uh, a damage assessment or uh, a casualty count at this time. And guys, it's still unclear whether or how Iran will react to this. Dan, if you could tell us a little bit more about the attacks the U.S. says its forces have come under in the Middle East over these past few weeks that sparked this. That's right. So there were nearly daily attacks over 10 days against U.S. forces based in Iraq and Syria. And there were a whole number of uh, U.S. forces that suffered minor injuries. And there was an, a civilian contractor who was sheltering in place during one of the incidents and died of a cardiac arrest. Here's what Pentagon Press Secretary Brigadier General Patrick Ryder had to say about that. Between October 17 and 26, uh, U.S. and coalition forces have been attacked at least 12 separate times in Iraq, four separate times in Syria, by a mix of one-way attack drones and rockets. I'm not going to have more specific information to provide to you from here in terms of specific groups that have claimed responsibility, other than to say we know that these groups are uh, affiliated with Iran. So that's that's him describing the injuries that were suffered. And, and of course, uh, he's not discussing exactly the specific Iranian-backed groups that carried out some of these rocket and drone attacks, but they're making clear that they hold Iran responsible for the actions of those groups. So, I mean, Ali, we're also hearing from the White House, President Biden sent a message to Iran's supreme leader warning about these recent attacks. What more can you tell us about that? Yeah, we heard from the president on Wednesday uh, during a speech that he gave with the Australian prime minister in the Rose Garden, where he issued a warning to Iran's Ayatollah. Uh, and he said, quote, my warning to the Ayatollah was that if they continue to move against those troops, we will respond and he should be prepared. And John Kirby was asked about that during yesterday's White House press briefing, really how that warning was delivered. He wouldn't give any de details, just saying that it was. But the U.S. is being uh, very clear to stress that this was done uh, separate from the U.S. diplomatic posture in the Middle East surrounding the Israel-Hamas war, that this was done as a deterrent. So this is definitely a delicate dance for this White House, uh, this administration, as it tries to defend U.S. forces without uh, potentially provoking a, a wider conflict in this area, guys. And Dan, before we let you go quickly, if you could just explain this to us, because it's an important nuance here. The Pentagon is trying to emphasize that these strikes are separate from the Israel-Hamas conflict, but Iran did warn the U.S. over its support for Israel at this U.N. meeting yesterday. How much of this is about telling Iran to stay out of what's going on in Israel? Is that at play here? I think it is at play. There's an implication there. But it's also significant to point out that this is not the first time that President Biden has ordered airstrikes against Iranian-backed groups attacking U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria. So in the first months of his term, in 2021, he ordered airstrikes in a kind of similar sort of a series of incidents, and then on another occasion. And it's also so important to point out that Biden did not order strikes directly against Iran in Iranian territory. So that shows you that they're trying to calibrate everything. They're desperately trying to avoid a full-blown regional conflict and, and protect U.S. forces and try to contain the situation, but also send very firm messages to Tehran not to endanger American troops. So I think we may see more of this, and uh, this is a very perilous moment, and uh, we're not out of this crisis. All right. Dan, Allie, thank you both. Appreciate you joining us this morning. Much more to come here on Morning News Now later this hour from the big screen to comedy shows. I'm going to show you how the founders of one company are flipping the script by opening doors for black artists. First, though, after the break, a look at the devastation in Mexico where Hurricane Otis left a deadly mark. And our latest storm system is on the move and keeping rain and snow in the forecast. Coming up, we'll show you whose weekend plans could be impacted. Welcome back. Let's get to the latest track on a storm system that could make for a rainy, even snowy weekend for some. Yeah, maybe really snowy. Angie Lastman is back with us this morning. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hi there, guys. Good morning. Happy Friday to you. We do unfortunately have some rain in the forecast, not just today, but through your Saturday and Sunday plans in some spots. So let's give you the details for the short term. As far as getting out the door this morning and spending any time outdoors, we'll see some of this, these showery kind of conditions lasting for places across the Midwest. We've already seen some snow falling in northern 
northern portions of the plains. And we're going to continue to watch this storm system chug a little farther to the east. And along and ahead of it, we could see some of these showers and thunderstorms developing. So the main focus is going to be basically Michigan to Texas, where we could see some of that active weather through the day today. As we get into tomorrow, we have this big surge of moisture that starts to work into portions of the plains. Some spots that have already received ample amounts of rain over the past couple of days, they're going to see more rain through the day tomorrow. And notice there is some snow possible once again. We'll see kind of an icy mixture too as we get into your Sunday plans, places like Wichita stretching into Illinois. We could see that snowy uh, kind of rainy mix. So we'll watch for that across parts of the plains and in the Midwest, of course, the rain too. But notice the Northeast and New England gets in on the action here as we get into Sunday. It'll be mainly just rain, but we will add in some additional rainfall, of course, happening on the weekend across the Northeast. So we'll watch for that. It looks like the highest amounts of rainfall, though, are going to be centered across the plains. We'll see localized amounts three to maybe up to five inches. So heads up for that. We could potentially see uh, some flooding concerns there. As far as the snow is concerned, one to three inches is the more widespread amounts, but we could see in some of the higher elevations up to nine inches. So something to watch for across portions of Colorado, mainly across the Rockies. Here's the area that I want you to be watching for for flash flood risk through the day today. Dallas, Waco, Steppenville, all included in that. Uh, so heads up, we'll see those rainfall rates over really saturated soil. That'll be something to note. And this is also something to note. And I think everyone's really sick of hearing me say this, <laughs> but Philly, New York, seven consecutive weekends with rain, eight of the last nine for Boston. And what happens this weekend? Well, Saturday, that's your day that you're going to want to be outdoors. It'll be really Ooh. warm, actually, guys. Temperatures are going to be kind of summer-like. Um, Sunday, things start to change. We'll get back into those mid-60s for some of these spots, and the rain will start to work in. So there you go. Something we nice will fine. not break the screen. We'll take it. Well, we'll take it, though. At least I it's mean, on Saturday. Exactly. Okay. So we can start the weekend. Bad with, New like, York. I need something. a yeah. sound effect with that. Hey, no. Yeah, I gave it to you. Don't worry. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you, Angie. Angie. International headlines now. We're going to start in Mexico, where we're getting a closer look at the devastation left behind by Hurricane Otis. That's right. NBC News correspondent David Noriega joins us now on this. Hey, David, good morning. Good morning. So, yeah, let's start in Mexico. The resort city of Acapulco on Mexico's Pacific coast is struggling to recover from the devastation of Hurricane Otis, which hit the city with unexpected force on Wednesday morning. At least 27 people died and four are missing. Much of the city remains without power and paralyzed by mud, which is hampering search and rescue efforts. Um, in China, former Premier Li Keqiang died of a heart attack Friday, just months after retiring from a long political career. He was a pro-business reformer, and he was once highly involved Influential. He was considered a contender for president and leader of the Chinese Communist Party. But he was sidelined when the current leader, Xi Jinping, consolidated power into his own hands. And to top it off, the surviving members of the Beatles are releasing a new song based on a demo recorded by John Lennon in 1970, shortly after the band split up. Paul McCartney says the producers used AI technology to isolate and clean up Lennon's vocals from the recording. The song is called Now and Then, and it's meant to be the band's last song ever. Wow. How cool is that? Cool. I know. Yeah. Looking forward to that. David, thank you so much. Coming up, the... it could be the testimony that makes or breaks his case. That's right. Former crypto CEO Sam Bankman Fried taking the stand in his own defense. We'll have the latest in his criminal fraud trial next up on Morning News Now. Welcome back. Later today, FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried will take the stand in his criminal fraud trial and testify in his own defense. That's right. Today's testimony comes after the judge, in a rare move, decided to hold a hearing on Thursday with Bankman-Fried first testifying without the jury there. In his testimony, he blamed his lawyers for bad advice and claimed the company was under the constant threat of cyber attack. For more on this, let's once again bring an attorney and NBC News Now legal analyst, Angela Senadella. Good to have you with us so okay Always. he answered questions without the jury there then today he's going to answer possibly the same questions with the jury there i have to admit i've never heard of this so why is this happening and what can we expect then today yes yeah, so it is very unusual and it's because the prosecution has already rested at this point in the trial it's only sam bankman freed left who's going to testify but look a defendant can't just get up there and say whatever he wants it has to have been introduced previously to the prosecution so they have a time to present it in their own case or do their own investigations. Basically, the judge didn't trust that this defendant wouldn't just get up there and say whatever he wanted. So he did an entire dry run, both of direct and on cross. So today we expect to see the exact same thing.
We also have been hearing from him a lot. There's a lot to work with just material that any of us could see, either on social media or interviews that he's given to the media. Do you think that's going to come up? Are prosecutors going to use that to kind of see if they can catch him anything? Could he perjure himself based on these interviews he's given? Savannah, 100% to the prosecutors. This is a gold mine. So even if he doesn't directly contradict himself, if there are any differences in presentation, the prosecution can use this to really just hammer down on his credibility to say, well, look, at this point, you presented yourself as knowing everything. Mm. And now you're saying you have no idea what happened because that's essentially his defense, pointing fingers, saying it wasn't me. I mean, yeah, Prosecutors have tried to paint him in an unflattering light. Of course, that's that's their job. But by looking at his post, talking about his political contributions, is the theory that taking the stand could try and sway how jurors feel yeah. about him and how dangerous is this move? It's so dangerous. But yes, his theory is that right now everyone's just doing this. I mean, it's literally just a game of who is most responsible. So the prosecution's cooperating witnesses, Caroline Ellison, Gary Wang, went up there and said, we just acted on direction of Sam Bankman Freed. So he's going to get up there. And even though he's presented himself as this brilliant mastermind, he actually has to say, I didn't know what was happening. It wasn't me. So he's getting up there to attempt to show some level of naive but it's very dangerous because as we've seen from his interviews time and time again, he does tend to present himself as knowing exactly what is going on. No one has ever accused him of not being smart enough, not knowing enough. So that's ironically what he has to present. Hmm. All right. We'll see what happens. Right. Angela Sinadella, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And coming up, they are flipping the script in the world of comedy. When we come back, my conversation with the people behind the American Black Film Festival is they open doors now for comedians of color. This is Morning News Now. We're back with our series, Flipping the Script, featuring people on screen, on stage, and behind the scenes, shining a spotlight on diversity. Enter the nice crowd. We're not talking about a group of polite people. We're talking about an entertainment company that has been giving black artists a huge platform since the 90s. I sat down with the power couple behind Nice Crowd, Jeff and Nicole Friday, to talk about their well-known film festival and now their newest venture. You need only spend a few minutes with Jeff and Nicole Friday to understand what drives them. What we're really trying to do and what our company Nice Crowd does is we want to level the playing field for people of color in the entertainment industry. That's really been our mission, to level the playing field. Like expert landscapers, they've been leveling that playing field since 1997. That's when Jeff launched the American Black Film Festival after going to another film festival. In visiting that festival, he realized that there were so many things about it that weren't even, if you will. And we really wanted to give those opportunities to people who ordinarily wouldn't have that in into entertainment or into Hollywood. What were the challenges you faced at the beginning? Corporate sponsorship was challenging. And if I'm being very honest, it, the, the idea was marginalized in the beginning. So 1997, 20 years before Oscars, hashtag Oscars so white, you know, before George Floyd's murder, and people just weren't committed to diversity. I can, I can just say it out loud. So I've endured this journey of marginalization and, you know, kind of putting it off to the side, and we've watched the world catch up to the mission of the festival. <laughs> the festival has given an early career boost to artists who've gone on to achieve great success. Anthony Anderson won the Rising Star Award in 2000. Black Panther director Ryan Coogler received an honor for his short film back in 2011. And Issa Rae says the festival gave her a big break, as she told IMDb. And for me, they showcased my work and brought me out early when I just had a web series and to be put on, on a level with so many other people I admire just meant so much to me. Your host for the evening. Earlier this month, Nice Crowd launched a comedy festival in Washington, D.C., showcasing comedians of color. The festival's name? Because they're funny. It's kind of a mission statement and a cool name, if you think about it. You know, why spend the effort to promote diverse comics? Why? Because they're funny. What can something like this hopefully do for a young comedian? Yeah, you know, our, our bread and butter is platforming deserving people that might not get a shot. So we're just replicating that model. You know, we really believe that everyone deserves a shot, and we just don't think that the comedy arena is diverse enough. We truly don't. And so this is just our effort to have some fun, 
and what we call do purposeful for-profit work, you know. And we want to laugh a lot. Now's a good time. I mean, comedy more than ever, we want to laugh. You don't understand how good it was out there. Five years from now, we're going to have a new comedy star, someone that'll have a television series and a $50 million movie that got their start right at our comedy festival. You say that with confidence. Oh, man, we, we, we've done it before. <laughs> Leveling the playing field in comedy, just as they've been doing in film for nearly three decades. As you point out, eventually Hollywood started to catch on and realize this was an important issue. Reality check. Where are we right now? Where do we need to go when it comes to diversity in film? I, I think we're in a great place. Uh, you know, um, I, well, I, I don't. Yeah, I mean, he thinks that we're in a great place. I don't know that I think we're in a better place, but I still think that there's a long way to go to make sure that there are more opportunities for people, not only in front of the camera, but those who are behind the camera and below the line. And we got to do a better job at uh, making sure that our industry is really forward thinking and leading the way globally. And we're just we're just doing us our little piece of it. You know, we're not going to change the world in our, in our lifetime. But if we can just shift it a little bit forward, we're, we're, we'd be very happy with that. And the next ABFF American Black Film Festival will take place in June in Miami. And it was just announced Issa Rae will be the creative director for that 2024 festival. I love that. Eh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Such a good moment. All right, let's get you some financial headlines now. Cruise is pulling the plug on its robo-taxis in an effort to help rebuild their reputation. It's NBC Savannah Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Savannah. Yes, yeah, so just days after California suspended the license of GM's cruise robo-taxi unit, the company announced it is grounding its entire fleet. That brings operations in Austin, Phoenix, and Houston to a halt. On Tuesday, California accused Cruz of withholding crucial video of an accident involving a pedestrian in San Francisco. In a statement last night on X, that's the platform formerly known as Twitter, Cruz said the suspension of service does not have to do with any new on-road incidents. Rather, it is a chance to reflect on how to better operate in a way that will rebuild public trust. Ford is postponing about $12 billion in planned spending on new electric vehicle manufacturing. The automaker says it is slowing down its investment because customers are increasingly reluctant to pay extra for EVs. Ford is not alone in hitting the brakes on EV plans. On Wednesday, Honda and GM said they were ending a $5 billion plan to develop lower-cost EVs together. Electric vehicle sales are still growing strongly, even at Ford, but not at the pace the automaker anticipated. And Taylor Swift has reportedly reached a new milestone in her career. The pop star's record-breaking Eras tour helped her achieve billionaire status, according to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. That index estimates her net worth now sits at $1.1 billion. Her Eras tour could gross $2.2 billion in North American ticket sales alone. And the subsequent concert film that hit theaters this month raked in nearly $100 million in its opening weekend. And by the way, Swift dropped her fourth album remake today with the release of 1989. Taylor's oh, I'm yes, sure you already knew that, Savannah. did. I've already heard it. There's five new songs. They are ridiculous. It's, it's a good day to be a Swift. I heard she had a good dinner last night, too. She oh. did. I, I did happen to be at the same restaurant as her, oh which my was God. also very cool. Amazing. There you very go. Cool. Savannah did not just burst into flames. Yeah, no, She's, you know, I kept it cool. I was going to say, what happened? She's still it's here too much respect. You know, it's like, girl, live this life. You are the best. Oh, amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Savannah. Thank you. All right. During the pandemic, California led the nation in the number of people experiencing homelessness. Today, many people are still struggling with rising costs, making necessities like housing and food feel out of reach. Well, one California cafe owner is working to change that. He's providing hot meals for those experiencing homelessness, served with an extra helping of support and respect. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson checked it out. It's just a little card pinned to the door. But for the customers and staff at the Homemade Cafe in Berkeley, California, it buys the most important meal of the day. So they can take one off and hand it to a waiter. The card says everybody eats, and it means just that. Basically, we treat them just like any other customer. They just don't get a bill. No one should go hungry in this world. Colin Dorn owns the Homemade Cafe. His breakfast of eggs, potatoes, toast, and coffee is served to anyone experiencing homelessness or food insecurity. 
the meal comes with a seat at any open table. When I first owned the restaurant, you know, people would come and they'd ask customers for food or panhandle. We just, you know, told them to ask me. And, you know, you don't need to bother our customers, but we will gladly feed you. And Colin stands by his work with the help of the community and their donations to help others. For every $5 a customer donates, another card goes on the board. Sir for Steve, how's the food? It's great, and I am so incredibly grateful to how they've helped me out in the past couple of weeks. What does it mean for you, though, to have a place where you can just have a hot meal when times are tough? Oh, it means everything. It really does. The cafe has been around since 1979. You ate here when you grew up. I did. I had the bacon and the French toast. <laughs> Colin and his family were neighborhood regulars. He went on to college in New York and planned on becoming a lawyer, but never quite let go of what he really loved. <laughs> you feel like a world away from what you wanted to be? Um, what I thought I wanted to be, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I like food, I like the energy, I like the interactions with the people. In 2011, he bought the Neighborhood Cafe and made it his own. You've always had maybe an affinity for this place, eh? Oh, absolutely. It's always been sort of a fixture in the neighborhood, in the community. Hi, guys. Hello. I have, I think I have chocolate pancakes. It's kind of like a family atmosphere. It is. Daniel was once a customer who needed to take one of those meal cards. I lived on this street right away for like eight years. You lived on this street? On like... this street, right here. Now he brings home a paycheck as the cafe's dishwasher. I came in one morning to just ask for food. And it's like, hey, brother, do you want to work? It meant a lot for me, giving me a job, waking up to say, oh, I got somewhere to go. Fortunately, the homemade cafe family is tight, Colin says, because last year was nearly a recipe for disaster. We were about this close to closing. Financial fallout from the pandemic, inflation, and meal delivery services hit the restaurant's bottom line hard. Take me back to when times were tough. Yeah, the community came through. My staff agreed to take a 20% pay cut to keep us open. Customers also led the charge for a GoFundMe account that's still turning out support so everyone eats can continue. People ask me all the time, well, how does that affect your bottom line? How can you afford to do it? If anything, the bottom line's gotten better. You feeding people for free has actually helped your bottom yes, line. Yes, it's absolutely counterintuitive to the standard capitalistic model of running a restaurant or business. But the more free food I give out, the more people I have come in and pay. Collins says he never expected such an outpouring of support to come with a simple purpose. Does that surprise you? You know, I wish I didn't have to do it. I wish there wasn't hungry people. Order up, please. And it's giving me faith that doing the right thing, doing things that need to be done, taking care of your fellow man, whoever they may be, whatever position they're in, is the right thing to do, and it's paying off. Our thanks to Steve Patterson for that report. What a fantastic story. Colin says business is up 15% and he expects to give away about 5,000 meals this year. How cool is that? All right, coming up, falling for fall. That's right. It's that coveted time of year where the leaves change color. We're celebrating the season with a look at the foliage that so many people wait all year for. Stick with us. We end this hour with a splash of color. It's that exciting time of year when the leaves change from green to vibrant oranges, reds, and yellows. It's beautiful. Just look behind us. Meteorologist Perella Lewis from our affiliate station, WYFF, in Greenville, South Carolina, takes us on a tour, giving us a peek at the fall foliage that truly makes the season feel magical. This is really fantastic. Tis the season that so many of us look forward to. Very vivid, very bright. A mountain of color used to decorate natural beauty, like the hundreds of waterfalls hidden inside the Appalachian Mountains. I think it's absolutely spectacular. Or the colors that line our highways, pulling leaf lovers out of their homes and into the mountains every single year. You think like how God creates such beautiful things. Sunshine, cooler temperatures, and rain are the trinity that helps jumpstart leaves changing colors right in front of our eyes. 
And autumn brings longer nights. And at the same time, the leaves stop producing chlorophyll, which makes the green colors we see in leaves. And that reveals other chemicals, like carotenoids that are present in the leaf, but finally get to show their colors for a change. I don't have words for it. If I did, I would be a genius. I would describe it. I think this is a great year. This is a great year. And according to professor of forest ecology Don Hagen at Clemson University, this year's colors have been delayed, but a vibrant season is still expected for the upstate. The first week of November should be approaching peak season this year. Don't wait around because it's not going to stay this way very long. Wow. <laughs> Look at that. If it did stay that way forever, though, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. But we get sick of it. So yeah, then you, you get to appreciate it. It's special. Exactly. <laughs> Barella Lewis, thank you for that beautiful tour. That was awesome. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Stay with us. Good morning. Good news. It is Friday. Thanks for being here. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, communities across Maine beyond and beyond rattled and on alert. The all-out manhunt for the suspected gunman is ramping up after shootings Wednesday night left at least 18 people dead. And we're learning new information this morning on the timeline of the murders. We've got more on that and the latest on the multi-state search for an alleged killer. In the Middle East this morning, Israel is setting the stage for that long-expected ground assault on Gaza, saying those targeted raids were all in preparation for a wider invasion. It comes as Gaza faces a growing humanitarian crisis. President Biden now calling on Israel to pause its offensive to allow vital aid to cross the border. Elsewhere in the region, the U.S. levying new strikes against Iran-linked sites in Syria overnight. We're covering it all. Also this morning, we are on Money Watch with some breaking inflation data coming up later in the hour. So how is the U.S. economy really performing in the wake of that blockbuster GDP number? You've got the numbers and what it means for your wallet. And of course, if it's Friday, get ready for your can't miss list. We are heading to the movies with a terrifying video game sensation making its big screen debut. Thank you for joining us. We're going to begin with the massive multi-state manhunt for the suspect in that deadly mass shooting in Maine that left at least 18 people dead. This morning, hundreds of officers are searching throughout New England for this man, 40-year-old Robert Card. We have team coverage this morning, beginning with Sam Brock in Lewiston. The clock is ticking this morning on an all-out manhunt for 40-year-old Robert Card, who's considered armed, dangerous, and likely off the grid. This is someone that should not be approached. After the mass shooting in Lewiston, Maine, that left 18 people dead and more than a dozen injured. Out of nowhere, he just came in and there was a loud pop. Card is accused of unloading an assault rifle, first at a bowling alley packed with teens for a youth league night, then minutes later at a popular local sports bar in Lewiston. Authorities expanding a shelter-in-place order. As overnight, they executed a search warrant at the Card family property, calling for anyone inside to come out with their hands up, eventually leaving after there was no sign of the suspect. Among many developments, law enforcement officials telling NBC News a note was recovered at Card's home. Police also say they found a gun in a white Subaru that's been linked to the suspect, though it's unclear if it's the same weapon used in the shootings. As the search continues, the public learning more information about Card and questions growing about his access to guns. Two senior law enforcement officials telling NBC News the weapon used by Card was purchased legally in 2023. As Card's family tells us, they were increasingly concerned about his mental health after he began hearing voices and making threats. His sister-in-law revealing they alerted police and military officials months ago. And a Defense Department official telling NBC that this July, Army battalion leaders informed staff that he was, quote, behaving erratically and contacted law enforcement. Card then receiving a medical evaluation. How could someone that fits that profile still be in possession of semi-automatic weapons? Well, I do think that the statutes around firearms and the possession of those are pretty complex. Former Army reservist Phil McGregor says Card taught him how to use an M16 rifle. He knew that weapon inside now. As the community reckons with the violence, a change of heart from a local Democratic congressman who'd previously been opposed to banning assault weapons for civilians. I now call on the United States Congress to ban assault rifles like the one used by the sick perpetrator of this mass killing. 
Our thanks to Sam Brock for that report. Robert Card is now facing multiple murder charges for the victims that have been identified so far. For more, we are joined now by Catherine Schweitz. She is the author of Stop the Killing, How to End the Mass Shooting Crisis and a former FBI special agent executive. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we know the gun was obtained legally by the suspect, as Sam mentioned. We're also learning Robert Card had a history of mental illness, especially recently. What can you first of all tell us about how easy it is to get weapons like the one that was allegedly used in this attack? I think in the United States compared to other countries, and I think that puzzles people in other countries, but in the United States, we default towards you can get a gun unless there's a prohibition. And where other countries have uh, essentially kind of licenses, many other countries have a license, so you have to get the license first and make sure that you're capable and able and safe. it's safe for you to have a gun. In the United States, it just isn't that way. So every state has its own regulations and the limited number of background checks that might be done or the amount of background checks. For one thing is, I think that's a kind of a, a scary loop is that we, loophole is that we don't have a way to check somebody after they've purchased the gun. So these are legally purchased guns, uh, but when somebody has mental health problems or somebody has stressors in their life, uh, there isn't a way to, uh, a very easy way to take the, a weapon away from somebody under those circumstances. Yeah, and we know now Card's family said he was experiencing a mental break in hearing voices. He had recently even been checked into receiving treatment for this. Uh, how does that information impact what goes on here in terms of an investigation and any kind of challenges it adds? Well, I think it's more uh, informative to, you know, preventing the next uh, shooting. Uh, it allows us to recognize that if we let somebody get to a crisis state, uh, like this gentleman obviously got to, uh, without um, doing the preventative efforts ahead of time for both mental health and any other stressors that he he had uh, domestic violence uh, issues in his background, um, and you know he had trouble with jobs in his background. Those all those kinds of stressors all add up to what this turns into. Because from an investigative standpoint, now. This is simply law enforcement looking for somebody who committed a crime. So we look, each state, of course, has its own laws. We're looking at Maine's law right now. And this shooting has really put it under scrutiny. Critics saying the laws there are just too lax, especially the yellow flag law. We've heard of red flag, but this yellow flag one, it allows police to ask a judge to take away a person's guns if a medical professional deems that person a danger. Doesn't seem like that might have happened in this situation. I mean, what's the reality here and what do you think are possibly the best solutions? I, I think that uh, not the legislators who passed it might not agree, but I think uh, yellow flag, which I don't know if whether it's been used actually in Maine, is kind of window dressing. Well, we say we we say we passed a law that has something to do with something. But getting uh, an in, a law enforcement officer to pick up an individual and take him to a medical professional to get an evaluation and then take that to the judge. And then if the judge adjudicates, then you take the weapons away. That's a lot of steps. And it's likely not going to happen very often. And, and so if ever. So I think it's unfortunate that that's as far as they've gotten in terms of if they want to change the laws in Maine, they need to change the laws. They need to change the laws that still allow people to hunt, but efforts to prevention are, have got to be stronger. All right, Catherine Schweit, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate your expertise on this. Yeah, thank you. And this morning we are learning more about the victims of this terrible tragedy. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa has some of their stories. Hi, Emily, good morning. Savannah, good morning to you. The people here in Lewiston understandably still in a state of shock from the unspeakable violence that uh, claimed the lives of 18 of their family and friends. At last check, we know three people here are still in critical condition. This is the worst mass shooting in the U.S. so far this year and the worst mass shooting ever for the state of Maine. Uh, this morning, residents of Lewiston, Maine are grappling with the grief of losing 18 of their own. She was a loving girl. She would be missed horribly. Among the victims of Wednesday's shooting, 53-year-old Trisha Aslin, who was enjoying a night off with her sister Bobby at the local bowling alley. Her mom says she was shot trying to call 911. Trisha didn't deserve that. Nobody did. The man that did that has no soul. I pray to God he doesn't do that to no more people. I hope they catch him soon. Where are you now? 
I'm coming to Maine the minute we find out when her body will be released from the morgue. I want to hold my baby one more time. I don't care. I want to put her in my arms. Kim McConville says her cousin, Billy Young, and his 14-year-old son, Aaron, were also among the victims. They're just innocent people, just innocent people out for a night of bowling. This was a children's event. You know, who expects a shooter to go into a children's event? Police say the gunman also went to Shemengi's Bar and Grill, where Joey Walker was a manager. His family says they waited an agonizing 14 hours before they learned he was among the eight people who died there. That moment when I got the call and said, Joey's dead. It, it just it brought me back. It brought me right back to my knees. His father, Leroy Walker, telling Lester, police told his son's wife that Joey died trying to help. He died as a hero because he picked up a, a butcher knife and he tried to go at the gunman to stop him from shooting anybody else. Does that change your pain at all? Oh. Knowing that? It, it made it worse. This close-knit community in disbelief that something so horrible could happen here. I'm going to go home tonight and, and be with my kids, and I'm not going to watch the news thinking, wow, that was in Florida or Texas. That was in my backyard. Surreal. Unreal. And the tragedy hitting Maine's deaf community especially hard. The wife of 36-year-old Joshua Seal says he was one of several members of the deaf community killed on Wednesday. The group were supposed to be going to the bar for a fun night of cornhole, a night that was shattered by just horrific violence. Joanne Savannah. Just so devastating. Emily, thank you so much. Turning now to Israel, where defense forces are preparing to carry out more raids in Gaza ahead of the anticipated ground invasion in the region. Israeli officials say they completed their second raid mission into northern Gaza yesterday, killing one of the Hamas leaders suspected of carrying out the October 7th attack in Israel. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel is in Jerusalem with the latest. The Israeli military conducted another incursion into the Gaza Strip, and we could see more of these in the coming days as Israel attacks Hamas and probes the group's defenses. Israel carried out another incursion into the Gaza Strip with a column of tanks pushing in for the second night in a row, this time in a new part of Gaza, further east, with drones and jets firing on what Israel says were Hamas command sites. <laughs> Israel's defense minister vows a full-scale invasion will come when the time is right, while airstrikes and limited incursions prepare the ground. Gaza is being leveled. One leading Israeli newspaper this morning describing the amount of force being used makes hell sound pleasant. The health ministry in Gaza, run by Hamas, says more than 7,000 Palestinians have been killed so far. Our crew in southern Gaza witnessed an Israeli airstrike and rushed toward it. A boy is rescued from the rubble, but a girl remains trapped. She's eventually freed, and our cameraman caught up with her in an ambulance. She's dazed at a hospital. She's treated on the floor, given air, and comes around as she's cleaned. She says her name is Miral and asks if her father is alive. The medic tells her he's fine, but doesn't know. The Israeli military says it's preparing to fight Hamas in the militant's network of tunnels under the Gaza Strip. It's a dangerous and complicated mission, especially since that's where freed hostages say they were kept. Israel increasing its estimate of the hostages in Gaza this morning to 229. The Israeli public is increasingly divided over the full offensive. A poll this morning saying 49% of Israelis saying Israel should wait. In Tel Aviv, families of hostages are growing frustrated, saying they're being forgotten in the push to expand the war. Before the, uh, the army getting inside Gaza, there is much more important thing to bring them back. A small amount of aid did get into Gaza this morning, but still no fuel needed to power generators at hospitals. Israel isn't allowing fuel in, saying it could go to Hamas. All right, Richard Engel, thank you so much.
Well, human rights groups are sounding the alarm about a major crackdown by Israeli authorities on Arab citizens who live in Israel that have been speaking out against the bombing of Gaza. NBC's Josh Lauterman spoke with some Arabs in Israel about their experiences and their fears. The Israeli city of Ramla, Arabs and Jews have been living, working, and raising families on the same land for centuries. Yusuf El Shamli, a grandfather and one of Israel's Arab citizens, says his family has been here for 80 years. But these days, Yusuf fears if he says one word about the suffering of Arabs in Gaza, the Shin Bet, Israel's internal security service, will arrest him. I ask him how it feels to be an Arab in Israel during a war. He says, we Arabs in Israel are like a divorced couple. The kids don't know where to go, to mom or to dad. We're in the middle. Since the Israel-Gaza war started, human rights groups say hundreds of Arabs have been fired, suspended from universities, or even arrested, accused of supporting terror or sympathizing with Hamas, mostly on social media. Israel's police chief has declared zero tolerance for inciting violence and pro-Hamas protests, saying on TikTok, anyone who wants to identify with Gaza, go ahead. I'll put them on buses and send them there. And the president of Tel Aviv University has vowed to be very strict with students who support Hamas writing, when we feel the offense is criminal in nature, we shall report them to the police. Hassan Jabarin runs Adala, an Arab human rights group representing 80 students who have been suspended or expelled. We are trying to explain that this people have the right of freedom of expression to express their anger against the war and to criticize Israel, but has nothing to do with supporting violence against Israelis. Amir, not his real name, was threatened with disciplinary proceedings after a social media post suggesting the historical oppression of Palestinians had led to the Israel-Gaza war. And what was the response to that post? Well, uh, the response was people accusing me of justifying terrorism. The university has sent me an email basically saying that they have reason to believe that I am supporting the actions of a certain side over the other. The side of Hamas, whose terror attacks killed more than 1,400 people and triggered an Israeli response that many Arab citizens say includes an unprecedented crackdown on free speech. Amir, who says he opposes violence against civilians, requested anonymity because he says he's concerned about even more retaliation for speaking out about what happened. How risky is it for you to be speaking out right now? I mean, everyone is terrified. Other Arab students have reported being doxxed, their home addresses posted on social media. <laughs> and popular Palestinian singer Dalal Abu Amna was detained for two days, then placed under house arrest, her lawyer says, after posting a Palestinian flag emoji and the Muslim phrase, there is no victor but God. She later took it down, but says in a new post, they tried to strip me of my humanity, silence my voice, and humiliate me in every way. Since the war started, Israel's police says they've investigated 110 cases of incitement on social media and arrested 90 people. At least 17 have already been indicted. Most, if not all, are believed to be Arabs, although the police haven't said. Israel police telling NBC News these acts of incitement present a significant threat to the stability of public order and the overall tranquility within our communities. In a nation of nearly 10 million people, roughly 2 million are Arab, about a fifth of the population. In many mixed cities in Israel, there are mosques right next to synagogues. Some Arabs who are also Israeli citizens say they feel caught between conflicting identities. Back in Ramla, Yusuf El Shamali is at the bustling shuk, or market, buying vegetables from Moshe, who he's known for 30 years. He tells me what you see in the media, Jews and Arabs always at odds, isn't what you see in the market. Here's a Jew. Here's a Jew. I'm an Arab. They're Arabs. Yusuf says, here in a mixed city, we're family. The problem, you see, is government. Our thanks to Josh Letterman for that report. Breaking overnight, the U.S. says it launched airstrikes on Iranian-linked targets in Syria. The Defense Department says the strikes were retaliation for a series of drone attacks on American military bases in the region. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has more on that. Gabe, good morning. Joe, good morning. A senior U.S. military official says the two locations hit overnight were a weapons storage area and an ammunition facility in Syria. It is not clear yet whether there were any casualties. Overnight, a dramatic retaliation. The U.S. striking two facilities in eastern Syria that the Pentagon says were used by groups linked to Iran. 
Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin calling them self-defense strikes that were a response to a series of recent drone attacks against U.S. forces. The Pentagon says there have been at least 19 attacks on U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria in the last nine days. 21 personnel have been injured. These strikes meant to deter Iran, which the U.S. says backs the groups launching the attacks. Austin saying, quote, Iran wants to deny its role in these attacks against our forces. We will not let them. We know that these are Iranian-backed uh, militia groups uh, that uh, are supported by Iran. And, of course, we hold uh, Iran responsible uh, for these groups. The new U.S. airstrikes come after President Biden delivered this stark warning to Iran's leader on Wednesday. My warning to the Ayatollah was that if they continue to move against those troops, we will respond, and he should be prepared. Amid rising tensions in the region, the Biden administration is walking a fine line, hitting Iranian-backed groups suspected of targeting the U.S. in an effort to deter future aggression, but not wanting to provoke a wider war. A senior administration official telling NBC News that these strikes were entirely separate from the current U.S. diplomacy surrounding the Israel-Hamas war, adding they have to do with restoring deterrence and going after the facilities that targeted our people. No response yet from Iran, Joe. All right. Gabe, thank you so much. We've got much more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including our continuing coverage of those tragic mass shootings in Maine and how everyday Americans are reacting to seemingly endless violence. But first, after the break, cleanup efforts are underway in Mexico this morning in the wake of Hurricane Otis, a historic Category 5 storm. We'll bring you the latest from there next. Welcome back. Cleanup efforts in Acapulco, Mexico have begun as officials begin assessing the damage left behind by Hurricane Otis. The historic Category 5 storm slammed the coast early Wednesday morning, making it the strongest hurricane to ever hit the eastern Pacific coast. Telemundo's Julio Vaquero has the latest. Utter devastation in Acapulco. At least 27 dead after a Category 5 hurricane slammed into the popular Mexican tourist destination, home to nearly a million people. No sé cómo estamos I'm not sure how we are alive, he says, but we are. Explosive Hurricane Otis, now the strongest storm ever to hit Mexico's Pacific coast. Otis more than doubled its strength just hours before landfall, leaving residents and tourists with little time to prepare. Some of the worst damage along the city's waterfront, where 165 mile per hour winds shredded high rise buildings and left the streets choked with mud and debris. The exterior of this hotel room, 21 stories up, ripped clean off as the terrified guests sheltered inside. With its streets underwater and power out for hundreds of thousands, Mexican authorities are now scrambling to assess the damage and provide relief. Our house was a total loss, this woman said, as desperate residents fend for themselves. The devastation in Acapulco has no precedent. This is one of the most famous and most important resorts in Mexico. Its recovery will be a huge challenge for the Mexican government and for President Andrés Manuel López Obrador. For now, we still don't really understand the scope of the damage. All right, Julio, thank you so much. We're heading now into the weekend here with some possible record high temps in store from the Midwest to the East. That's right. Angie Lastman is here with the latest. Hey, Angie. Hey, guys, what's up? We've got, uh, I'll tell you, some summer-like conditions here across much of the country. We're talking 80-degree temperatures in a lot of spots. We've got St. Louis, Little Rock, Nashville, Roanoke, Washington, all headed to the 80s today. These temperatures will, in some spots, flirt with the records, of course. Uh, and we've got upper 70s for Syracuse, running more than 20 degrees above normal for this time of year and even across portions of the Great Lakes mid 70s in Detroit today we will deal with some rain in a couple of these spots but still some really warm temperatures out ahead of that storm system that's going to be a little problematic make it a little bumpy for us as we get into the weekend as we look ahead to tomorrow more of the same we of course start to see some of that cooler air filtering in behind the system but folks up and down the east coast from Augusta down to Wilmington and into Savannah you'll see temperatures running way warm we've got 80s on on tap once again tomorrow from Richmond 
into Savannah, Birmingham, Nashville, all included in that as well. Upper 70s for Detroit, and we'll see numerous record highs likely across that region again for tomorrow. Now, as we look ahead into next week, Sunday really into Monday, that's when we start to see things shift. The pattern changes up a little bit as that system works a little closer. We'll go from the upper 70s in Nashville on Sunday to the mid-50s on Monday and even chillier than that by Tuesday. Similar story for New York. Upper 50s Sunday. We'll kind of flirt with those mid-60s Mondays, but we'll be back to the 50s on Tuesday. And we go from the 80s to the 50s in just a couple of days in Richmond. So we'll start to see that cooler, more fall-like air start to filter in behind the system once it works a little farther to the east. In the meantime, we've got rain that we're watching through the day today from the Midwest down through parts of the Southern Plains. We've got frost and freeze conditions happening out west, and we've got great conditions up and down the east coast. So I showed you those really warm, nice conditions that we'll deal with. Uh, we'll stay dry through the day today for most locations as well. But notice what happens here across parts of the Midwest and into the plains. We've got the showers that we're going to track from that system working a little farther to the east. And then especially as we get into tomorrow, big batch of moisture starts to surge into that region. The southern plains will deal with some heavy rain as well as the potential for some uh, kind of an icy mix, even some snow in that region. And then we'll start to see this shift a little farther to the east here as we get into Sunday. So Sunday will be the day that we deal with some showers across parts of the northeast and New England. Looking ahead to the rest of the weekend, I think the record highs will be something that will get your attention tomorrow across the east. Out west, it looks really quiet, too, for your Saturday. So outdoor plans should be good to go there. We'll deal with the Santa Ana winds out there, though, on Sunday. So heads up for that. And then, of course, that flood risk and the rain that we'll see across much of the country here on Sunday. The southeast looks pretty nice on Sunday, though. So you'll have plenty of warmth and sunshine to go around. And if you're looking ahead to mm -hmm. Halloween evening, we've Ooh, got some cute. spooky showers, guys. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> some scary snow across uh, parts of the Great uh, Lakes. I know. It is scary to say snow across the Great Lakes and... Uh... On, on Halloween evening. We don't want that. We don't want to wear jackets for our costumes. No, umbrellas Ooh, ruin everyone's look at this, costumes. Look at this music. Look, look at Regina, LA. Our 72 in LA on, on Halloween evening. 80s in Miami. You might deal with some showers, but uh, Minneapolis, 32 degrees. Wow. I have a feeling kids are going to be in coats. Yeah, but every if you're from Minnesota, you remember the Halloween blizzard many, many, many years ago. 30 inches of snow. Oh, Nothing will my. ever top that on Did Halloween. you trick or treat? Inches. I think we started started to and then we made our way in. Yeah, you're so, like this is Oh my gosh, when I went to school in Boulder, it always snows before Halloween every year. It's like yep. a thing you know and everybody's in these little costumes and these coats. It's ridiculous. It was devastating as a kid in Detroit right. when it would snow and you'd have to wear a coat to ruin my costume. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Angie. Angie. Well, that was so fun and festive. <laughs> All right, let's get you some international headlines now, starting with a close call involving a U.S. Air Force bomber and a Chinese fighter jet over the South China Sea. NBC News correspondent David Noriega joins us with that and other world headlines. David, good morning. Yeah, guys, good morning. So a Chinese fighter jet flew within 10 feet of a U.S. bomber over the South China Sea this week. That's according to the U.S. Uh, Defense Department. The Pentagon also said that the Chinese plane was flying at an uncontrolled excessive speed. As you know, the South China Sea is the site of territorial disputes between China and other countries. And in the past, China has demanded that the U.S. stop these military flyovers in the area. Next, more than 1,600 migrants arrived on Spain's Canary Islands in the last week, including on one boat that was carrying 320 people. That's a record for a single vessel on this migrant route, according to the Spanish state news agency. These islands are off the coast of Africa, but they belong to Spain, which means that migrants who set foot there can then go on to seek asylum in mainland Europe. And finally, Maggie Smith, she's the 88-year-old actor who's known for playing Professor McGonagall in the Harry Potter movies, is the latest model for luxury fashion brand Loewe. The photos of Smith for the brand's spring and summer 2024 campaign were shot by Jurgen Teller, and they blew up the moment they hit social media. Back to you guys. <laughs> <I> <laughs> love Maggie Smith. love that. What a great idea. That's okay. awesome. All right, David, thank you so much. Coming up, contextualizing tragedy. After the break, we'll take a closer look at how gun violence is affecting more and more everyday Americans and the mounting frustration over a perceived lack of action that's coming along with it. That's next on Morning News Now. The mass shooting in Lewiston, Maine, is the latest in a disturbing trend of gun violence in our nation. According to the Gun Violence Archive, there have been 565 mass shootings nationwide so far this year, killing 597 people. And the archive says, based on data, the U.S. is on pace for 700 shootings this year. 
NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Goss takes a closer look at the gun violence epidemic. Another community ripped apart by America's gun crisis. Frustrated, worried. We know a close friend has passed. At least 18 lives lost in the Lewiston, Maine mass shooting. The 565th mass shooting in 2023 and the deadliest so far this year, according to the National Gun Violence Archive, which defines a mass shooting as at least four victims shot, excluding the shooter. Pray for the families, pray for these victims. It got, things have got to be changed, have got to change. We have to start doing better. That grief felt across the country time and time and time again, with more than 35,000 people killed by gun violence so far this year. <laughs> Families in Monterey Park, California, still recovering from the horrific killing of 11 people at a dance hall studio that took place just three weeks into the new year. Flowers and pictures lining the entrance of an elementary school in Nashville after six people, including three children, were shot and killed there in March. And a community in Allen, Texas, grieving the nine murdered at an outlet mall in May, and now calling for change. The heartbreak and anger in Lewiston, Maine, also felt less than 300 miles away in Newtown, Connecticut. We know that gun violence is preventable. We need to do more to stand up to this issue, to enact safe laws, and to create the safe communities that we all deserve. Um, so I'm, I'm incredibly saddened, but also very angry. Nicole Hockley watching another mass shooting unfold nearly 11 years after her six-year-old son Dylan was killed along with his 19 classmates and six teachers at Sandy Hook Elementary School. I just wish my little boy was back by my side. He, he would be turning 18 in a couple of months. And I often think about how tall he might be now, or he'd be a senior in high school, what what life experiences might be ahead from him. And, and I'll just, I'll never know because he's frozen at six. Hockley turning her anguish into action, helping launch Sandy Hook Promise, a nonprofit that works to protect children from gun violence through programs and bipartisan policy. No one should feel unsafe wherever they go, whether it's their school or their bowling alley. Everyone should be and feel safe and we have the power to make that happen. More families impacted by senseless gun violence and the nation once again united in grief. Our thanks to Stephanie Gosk for that report. In the wake of Wednesday's shooting, Representative Jared Golden of Maine is calling for a ban on assault weapons. Last July, he was one of just five Democrats opposing such a measure. Well, an Idaho judge has denied a request from the legal team of Brian Koberger, the man accused of murdering four University of Idaho students, to have his indictment dismissed. Yeah, the push was based on an alleged error in juror instructions. NBC's senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has that. Hey, good morning, guys. If everything had gone as scheduled, I'd be here talking to you about the start of Brian Koberger's trial set for this month. Instead, the case has been bogged down with delays for months, but those days could soon be over as four families wait for answers. Just because the courts didn't like... This morning, the murder trial against Brian Koberger moving full speed ahead after a judge in Idaho refused to dismiss the whole case. I appreciate the argument. I think it's really uh, creative. I am going to deny that, uh, that argument. Prosecutors and defense lawyers battling in court for hours Thursday. The judge opting to keep cameras in the courtroom over Koberger's objection. He's been charged with the stabbing death of four University of Idaho students, Zana Carnodal, Ethan Chapin, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Gonsalves, in this off-campus home. His defense team arguing the prosecution wrongly instructed the grand jury to indict using a standard of proof lower than required. There's clearly the prejudice in the record that the court can see from what they were being instructed. The judge finding no support for that claim, saying his hands are tied. I am constrained by the by existing law. I can't just change the law. Much of the legal wrangling in the case has been shrouded in secrecy. Hours of arguments earlier Thursday held behind closed doors. The grand jury uh, is secret, so that's why it's sealed. 
Koberger's defense team urging the judge to dismiss the case on other grounds as well, suggesting in court papers the grand jury was biased, there was insufficient evidence to charge him, and prosecutors withheld other evidence that could exonerate him. What exactly that evidence might be remains unknown. A judge entered a not guilty plea on Koberger's behalf in May. The state has said it is seeking the death penalty. All rise. Meantime, the families of the victims are anxious for a trial date, as next month marks one year since the grisly killings rattled this tight-knit community. They were amazing, amazing kids in the prime of their life. The mother of Ethan Chapin appearing at a true crime convention in September with a simple message. Don't forget these kids. As for the house where the four victims were murdered, it is still standing for now. The university has been paused. It's plans to demolish it as the court proceedings inch forward. Back to you guys. All right, Laura, thank you so much. Coming up, we're watching your money this morning with some breaking inflation data that's giving us an idea of just how well the U.S. economy is really doing. And who better to break down those numbers than one half of our amazing <laughs> Morning News Now economic dream team. He's alone, but he's still great. Investopedia's yeah. Caleb Silver. Caleb came next. on a Friday for us. <laughs> Brian, where are you at? We are back with some breaking economic data. So the Personal Consumption Expenditure Price Index, which is another monthly report that measures inflation, out for the month of September, rising by 0.4% on the month. Personal income came in at 0.3%. Personal spending was 0.7% on a monthly basis. So obviously, Caleb Silver is here, Investopedia's editor in chief. We don't know where Brian huh? went, delinquent <laughs> on this <laughs> Friday. I know. Let's frame all the shots with just an empty space next to you. All right, what does this mean? What does this tell us about the economy? This is exactly where we thought we would be. Inflation has cooled way down from last June when it was at 9%. We've got this 3.4% range. We know the Federal Reserve would like to see that at 2 2.5%. But this is kind of where we're going to be with inflation. Prices have come down to this level, still high for food, still high for shelter. But the Fed looks at PCE, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index, because it measures a more dynamic view of the economy. Mm -hmm. They're meeting next week. This will probably tell them this is exactly where we thought we'd be at this point. And the fact that personal income keeps rising tells us that the consumer still has some gas in the tank. So yesterday, we also then saw GDP up 4.9% year over year, third quarter, better than expected. What were some of the factors that boosted that number? Spending. We mm. continue to spend aggressively, whether that's on experiences, thank you, Taylor Swift, whether that's on <laughs> travel, whether that's on groceries, whether that's dining out, we continue to spend. Consumer spending, 70% of GDP here in the U.S., and that is what's keeping the economy going. But if you look at this report, personal income is still growing a little bit, and the savings rate is about 3.4%. Now, back during the pandemic, that was around 18%. But the normal state for personal savings is around 2%. So we're continuing to spend, but we still have some money in the bank, by and large, across the country. So as you mentioned, Fed's meeting next week. You also mentioned people probably racking up some interest rates on those credit cards as they keep on spending. What do you think we might see from the Fed next week? Yeah, the Fed meets in five days, five hours, and 20 minutes. I'm not counting. But they're not going to raise rates next week. They may not raise rates again this year. The rate raise may be over. Why? Because by all those rate hikes that have happened over the past 20 months, they have a little delayed effect. They are really starting to take effect throughout the economy. If you look at the housing market and the new car market, those are really slow right now. But this is kind of the steady state of inflation. So don't expect that two and a half percent, but probably no rate hike. But the Fed's going to keep these rates high for a while. So if you have consumer debt, credit card debt, yeah. that's going to keep rising. You got to watch your own balance. Sheet. Does something have to give here? It's going to be the consumer. If the consumer stops spending and feels like a recession's coming or they're worried about their job or they can't pay their bills, that's going to put the economy in a, in a big break right now. So that's not happening. We continue to spend going into the holiday season. We'll probably oh, see more right. of that. And sure. then the bills are going to come in the new year. We'll see how we deal with that. All right. <sighs> All right, Caleb, always great to see you. Thanks Thank for you. handling it solo today. <laughs> we appreciate you. More financial news. Apple watches could soon be a little harder to get your hands on. Silvana Hanau is back with us with more financial headlines. Hey, Silvana. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Yeah, so Apple is facing a potential import ban in the U.S., over a technology dispute involving the company's Apple Watch. Now, the U.S. International Trade Commission decided on Thursday that Apple violated the patent rights of medical technology company Massimo by using light-based technology to read blood oxygen levels. Now, most Apple Watches made after 2020 have this feature. The decision now faces presidential review and possible appeals. The Biden administration has 60 days to potentially overrule the decision. 
OpenAI, that's the parent company of ChatGPT, is forming a new team to study what it calls the potentially catastrophic risks of the technology. The company says the newly formed preparedness team will track, forecast, and even try to protect against some of the major issues caused by AI, from generating malicious code or phishing attacks to more far-ranging issues like nuclear threats. And as part of the team's work, OpenAI is asking people to send ideas on ways AI can be misused for it to study. The company is offering a $25,000 prize for the top submissions. And companies that make deodorant are benefiting from the pushback to get workers back into the office. Unilever, which makes Axe, Degree, and Dove antiperspirants and deodorant, says it is seeing a 15% rebound in sales now that Americans are spending less time at home and more time at work, guys. Wait, so people weren't wearing deodorant when That's, they were I at home? I thought the I'm same like, thing. still wore deodorant. Like, wait a second, exactly. <laughs> we're, we're, is there nobody buying toothpaste either? Right. Like, what? Oh, Disgusting. That's a, yeah. Oh, we yeah. have to do more Come on, on that. On. All right, yeah. Savannah, thank you. <laughs> Maybe people are, like, True so thing. nervous back at work. They're like, I need more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so weird. T piling it on. <laughs> yeah. <triple down. laughs> that is just, that all is right. not what yeah. I was right. expecting. That's always deodorant. That is scary news in itself. But we've got a particularly spooky edition of our Friday Can't Miss list in store for you. Oh my gosh, I'm so into this music. With a terrifying video game scare fest that's made its way to the big screen, we've got more on that and all the other can't miss content. That was Joe, not part of the soundtrack. For your Halloween weekend, up Welcome back. It's the end of an era, and for many, it's a hard one to bear. Yes, the beloved giant pandas at the Smithsonian National Zoo are waving their final goodbyes before a long journey home to China. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell is in D.C. with the latest on the giant panda's final bow. Good morning, Joe and Savannah. Just a couple of weeks left for visitors here to see the giant pandas at the Smithsonian National Zoo before they travel to China with their veterinarian and zookeepers. China owns all of the pandas in the United States, and that contract is ending in December. The National Zoo is sending them a little bit early without giving us a specific date after a half century of history right here in Washington. Saying goodbye can be unbearable. The beloved giant pandas of the Smithsonian National Zoo so cute. have long been the most popular attraction here. I am sad to see them go, but it was neat to see them today. A sentimental transition is underway for the panda staff. I see them almost more than I see my family at home, so it's... It's hard not to love your job when you're working with pandas every day. The big change ends 50 years of panda diplomacy. In 1972, First Lady Pat Nixon welcomed the gift from China. I am pleased to be here and accept the precious gift of the panda. Later, China leased pandas to U.S. zoos, and that deal is over, forcing the return of Mei Zhong and Tian Tian after 23 years in Washington and their cub, Xiao Qi Ji. Certainly, uh, lots of mixed emotions. To prepare for a 19-hour flight to China, the pandas are now in crate training. Hey, look at that. That is the biggest part of preparation for their shipment is because where they're going to be spending hours in that crate. So we want to make sure that they're very comfortable. Their flight is a kind of Panda Express operated by FedEx. FedEx has actually transported 15 pandas on 10 separate uh, flights over the past two decades. With extraordinary in-flight dining, 60 to 80 pounds of bamboo will be served, plus favorite treats. Mei Shang really loves her pears, Tian Tian really loves sugar cane, um, Chao Shi Ji likes butternut squash, and then they'll all get apples or carrots, sweet potato, things like that. For fans, their November farewell is bittersweet. I'm just heartbroken that they're leaving. When the pandas do leave here in Washington, the zoo plans to renovate their exhibit with the hope that other animals will make it their home soon and perhaps even other pandas in the future. The only remaining place in the United States will be the Atlanta Zoo with four giant pandas. But that contract also ends next year. So the fate of the pandas inside the U.S. is uncertain. Joe, Savannah. <laughs> All right. Thanks to Kelly O'Donnell. Finally Thank this you. hour. 
It is Friday. That means it's time for your weekly can't miss list. And this week we have all the spooky movies and streaming shows you need to see on this hollow weekend. That's right. We also have something else we're going to start with, though, <laughs> with Bravos. <laughs> Darren Karp, our BFF, our LA lady, back with us. Always. I'm in 1989 blue this morning well, because Taylor has released Taylor's version. This is Savannah's can't miss list today. As <laughs> soon as I knew I could talk about it, I was like, how, how many people did Savannah pay in order for me to talk about this? <laughs> but it is here. This is not a spooktacular album. No. This is actually my favorite Taylor Swift album. So this is the fourth re-recorded album coming from Taylor Swift. This is all in response to her 2019 Masters Dispute. Uh, but this is her fifth album that she ever created. There's a few secret hidden tracks. How many have you listened to already? I've listened to all of them. And except we, for, did you know Spotify crashed last night and you couldn't get to the vault tracks? And it was uh, like, ah! Not surprising. Do you have a favorite one? Like, do you like this version? I like that she came out with a song Slut because I feel like it's a direct response into what she's been called over the she years. I don't think you were like, expecting that, I Joe. Prepared. I mean, this is my morning tea for you. <laughs> um, but it's a really... It's like a play on... You know, it's a, yeah. She's... Yeah. she's, she's She's making fun of the people who have made fun of her uh, in the past. Just like and she's she taking back space power. On this what do you album? think of the album cover? Like this is uh, it's fantastic. Okay. She's recreated all these photos. It's just really cool her reclaiming it. Also, I know you said your favorite song, Bad Blood, right? Yeah, I love Bad Blood. I know, and that's on this album. It's so so back at the time, she released it, and then she released a remix with Kendrick Lamar. She just announced like 20 minutes ago that they re-recorded that too, and oh, she's so dropping this that. Is, so this Kendrick's back. This is wow. big. Yeah, Joe, have you listened to Joe? I know Bad Blood. I know, I know Bad it. Blood. I know Shake Bad. It Is there a Halloween song? Did she do a Halloween song? No, Shake no. It no. Off. No. But she loves it autumn, off. so we're just, we're in autumn. You we're like, autumn. To, you like, like to be autumn. autumn. I do like autumn. Okay, just okay. give it a okay. listen. It's so this great. Is, we're going to, we'll hang out. We'll hang out. You're in your blue. Office party. We should talk about Halloween stuff, I guess. I do have some Halloween stuff. There are some movies, right? Including, including the one that looks really scary. Five Night at Freddy's, which I wasn't really expecting to be kind of crazy. Creepy, but if you look at this, it's basically about this, you know, troubled, rundown security guard who goes to take this kind of job he's not really expecting. Think like Chuck E. Cheese is, oh, is what right, Freddy's right. really That's is. Scary. Not that the folks so. at Chuck E. Cheese want you to think From, that. Yeah, back in the day, you know, it's like an animatronic <laughs> show. Yeah. But of course, this is Halloween. So when he takes the when he takes the job at night. Um, the animatronics come to life, of and course. it's pretty terrifying. And they're not cuddly. <laughs> they're not cuddly. Wait, this is hysterical. No, but like, it's funny because it's so uncomfortable. Like, but as I was scary? watching it, yes, it is scary. Josh Hutcherson <laughs> is in it. It is scary, it's but a, it's it like shouldn't be. Right, but it like shouldn't be. And I'm uncomfortable, but it is a very, very good movie to kind of watch. I then, feel like they don't need help making those animatronics scary. So no, I can like, imagine it would be a very quick little it's very Twilight Zone kind of come to life yeah. in a way. Yes. All right. And Wolf Like Me is another one, right? Wolf Like Me, also on Peacock. Both of those are on Peacock that you can stream. So our, our sister streaming network, which is great. This stars ja Josh Gad as well as Isla Fisher. Season one was already out. And if you kind of remember, oh, Josh right. was this single father living in Adelaide, Australia. He was just not capable of emotionally supporting his child, physically supporting his child. He just couldn't, he couldn't really be there. Meets Isla Fisher. They have an unexpected friendship. She turns out she's a werewolf, so she's been keeping the secret forever. <laughs> so this is going to compromise their relationship. They keep meeting up serendipitously. In the season two, though, no real spoiler, she does get pregnant with a wolf baby. So <laughs> this is also good for, for Taylor Swift to wolf babies. I love the list this morning. You guys are really like, give me the hard hating news. Uh, but this is just thing. It turns out she's a werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, but, that's what happens. BTW. The By the way, and she's pregnant with a little wolf baby. Baby. No spoilers, but, but oh my God. we have 45 okay. seconds. We want to try and get through whatever else we can. Yeah, I like yeah. this historical romance thriller. Yeah, this is historical fiction. It's called Fellow Travelers. This is an eight-part series on Showtime. Uh, Good-looking guys. These are like political operatives that essentially fall in love during the height of the Lavender Scare of the 1950s okay. and uh -huh. during the McCarthy era. They fall in love at probably one of the worst times that you can probably mm. fall in love. Yeah. They go through everything. They go through all the kind of think Forrest Gump, but in this love story. So they're going through the Vietnam oh. War. They're going through... McCarthyism, they're going through the AIDS epidemic, and their love story is really timeless, yeah. but it can be volatile at times. Okay. But it's a beautiful, beautiful historical Scott story. Scott Bomer, who's great. And yeah. we're yes. not going to have time, but there's two shows set in Florida called Neon and Pain Hustlers. I'm sure they're yes, great, right. Yes, Reggaeton Artists. That's going right. to be good, Neon. On right. Right. Very go. cool. Darren, thank you so much. Love you. No bad blood here, here guys, right? Now. We can no shake it off. <laughs> Welcome to New York, Darren. <laughs> thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that does it for this hour of morning news now. News continues right now. <laughs> 
Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.